Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is especially obscure. It is Plata Portrigo, as published in Short Stories magazine in 1891. This story is attributed to the St. Louis Globe Democrat, with no author named. It claims to be a true tale of old Mexico, but I have been unable to find it printed or referenced anywhere else. Some brief notes before I begin. Firstly, this story is sprinkled with various Spanish words and terms. I will pronounce them to the best of my ability and define most of them in on-screen text, but for the most part I don't think it's necessary, and the listener can simply infer the meanings from the context. However, the writer never defines the most important term in the story, which is the title. It means silver for wheat. Secondly, this story starts out with some generalizations about Mexicans and a reference to brown-skinned people that may cause some apprehension. We wouldn't make these types of generalizations today, and a person might worry that some more problematic stereotypes are going to come up later. Fortunately, our anonymous author really does love these characters, and none of the generalizations are unkind or mean-spirited. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. During the short reign of the Mexican Emperor Iturbide, there lived in the town of Zapotlanejo, in the state of Jalisco, a jolly muleteer, Don José Marín, whose little house of well-whitewashed adobe on the outskirts of the town sheltered Dona Paz Rama de Marín, his wife, and ten children, after the good old Mexican fashion of large families, which has not yet died out, despite railways and French bonnets and corsets. This numerous brood of brown-skinned youngsters consisted of just five girls and an equal number of boys, the youngest a babe of a few months, the oldest a muchacha, muy guapa, the pretty, frisky Isabel, with great black eyes, lips like cherries, and the gayest of hearts. As the children increased, the little house had been gradually extended, till now its walls enclosed eight comfortable rooms, furnished with the utmost simplicity, the parlor having, in a broad gilt frame, a colored print of Our Lady of Guadalupe, a little picture of the Emperor Charles V, and a few lithographs of remarkably ugly saints. In one corner was a tidy altar on which stood, clad in bright raiment, an image of the Blessed Virgin, before whom forever burned a little candle set in a brown earthenware candlestick, the clean white altar cloth being always in the morning strewn with fresh flowers, a duty which Dona Paz or Isabel never neglected. The sweet domestic side of the Catholic faith is thus almost universally illustrated in Mexican homes and suits well the gentle character of the people. Every morning of their lives, Paz and Isabel, and one child after another, knelt before the household altar and commended themselves to heaven and to the protection of the Mother of God. Nor did Don Jose frown upon this charming manifestation of piety, for, though not a good churchman, he lived uprightly and went to confession at least twice a year, and was on excellent terms of neighborly friendship with Father Nicholas, the parish priest of Zapotlanejo, a true servant of God, as are many of the humble priests of the little towns of Mexico to this day. Nor did Don Jose meddle with politics. By nature he was a moderate man. He had, it is true, a few years ago taken part as a cavalry soldier under General Iturbide against the Spanish army, but more from neighborly sentiment than national patriotism. His cronies in the little town, Dionisio Maza, the shoemaker, Carlos Donde, the shopkeeper, with whom traded the poorer classes of townspeople, and Agapito Bravo, the blacksmith, all strong anti-Spanish in their sentiments, had enlisted under Iturbide, and Don Jose thought it a pleasant thing to go off campaigning with them. But, as he said, he did not care the toss-up of a real which won the patriots or the Spaniards. It would be all the same whoever won, for wheat would still have to be carried to Guadalajara, and he, as the owner of ten mules, would always find work enough to do. 
The day he left the town, mounted on a big black horse with his saber drawn, the little troop setting out for the wars, Dona Paz hugged him and wept over him, and Isabel kissed his hand over and over again, and then ran back to the house to dry her tears and commend her querido papa to the Virgin. In a few months the war was over. Jose arrived home none the worse for the campaigning, save that a Spanish trooper had skillfully carved off the tip of his right ear with a long saber. And all his companions came back, too, in high glee at the defeat of the king's troops. It was a matter of warm discussion in the little town when General Iturbide proclaimed himself emperor, and Jose's fellow soldiers were divided in their opinion as to the wisdom of having fought to drive out one monarch to set up another, but, as Jose sententiously observed, if we're to have an emperor, gracias a Dios that he is a Mexican and not a gachupin, caramba! Jose resumed his vocation of a carrier or muleteer, and, the war being over, had plenty to do. Every week he tramped behind his mules to Guadalajara, the animals loaded with sacks of grain, and frequently returned from that great city with higher loads of goods for the merchants of Zapotlanejo. One day, in August 1823, while on the road to Guadalajara, the mules well laden with wheat, Jose, in his sandals, white cotton trousers, and blouse trudging behind, he suddenly fell in with a tall, dark man, who accosted him with, Hola, amigo, a donde va? On being informed by Jose that the destination of the little caravan was Guadalajara, the stranger begged to be allowed to accompany him, as the roads were dangerous, there being a mucha mala gene about, and he had a bit of money with him, and felt insecure traveling alone. Jose took a keen look at the stranger, whom he perceived to be unarmed, save, perhaps, the customary knife under the sash, and, being himself a trifle lonely, acceded cheerfully to the man's request. Despite the rather forbidding look, the stranger turned out to be good company. He had served in the war on the Patriot side, he said, and he related with much vivacity many good stories of adventure. Jose, always communicative, spoke freely of himself and of his hope, in a few years, to get money enough to buy a coat with which to start a stage line to Guadalajara, letting his nephew manage the mules till such time as his eldest son, Juan, might be able to attend to the carrying business. The two friends jogged on together till the domed city of Guadalajara came in view, and, on entering the town, they separated with mutual good wishes. Jose went to his customary maison, where, when in the city, he lodged himself and his mules, first delivering his grain to a local dealer, taking in return a bag of silver pieces for the grain merchant of Zapotlaneo. The next morning, himself refreshed, and the mules lightly laden with a few goods destined for Zapotlaneo traders, Jose treated himself to a glass of Catalan and started out of the city again encountering at the gate the acquaintance of the previous day, who asked to be permitted to accompany him a short way back. The stranger had purchased a wiry little horse, and, as Jose was now mounted on a mule, they were well matched as to speed, and in condition for a comfortable homeward journey. The stranger was as entertaining as before, he had much to say of the good results of his visit to Guadalajara, and told of his recovering a sum of money of considerable amount from an old debtor, who, during the war, had been unable to meet his obligation. And, in truth, he could show some very well-filled saddlebags. Early in the afternoon, José and the stranger stopped at a roadside maison to refresh themselves and their beasts. They drank several glasses of fiery Catalan, ate heavily, and then lay down for a siesta. The place was a familiar one. Jose knew Don Miguel, the landlord, and so felt no uneasiness, for Miguel, from time out of mind, had kept the maison. All Zapotlaneo knew and trusted Don Miguel. When Jose awoke, the stranger had to be spoken to several times to awaken him, and, bidding goodbye to Miguel, who had also taken his usual nap, the fellow traveler set out in right good spirits. After going about three leagues, the stranger bid Jose a cheery adios, thanking him for his confidence and companionship, and the two parted on excellent terms. Later on, perhaps a league away, Jose noted with surprise that one of the money sacks carried by a bonny white mule appeared tied in a manner not his own. 
Curiosity, more than apprehension, caused him to stop and untie the bag, he thinking all the time that Miguel might have found the cord unloosened and had good-naturedly retied it. Diantre! shouted poor Jose. The bag was filled with small stones. He turned pale, felt the blood leave his head, and nearly fell. With nearly all the strength gone out of his body, he opened the three other money sacks. Only stones. Then Jose cursed his folly and cursed the deceitful stranger. May the devil of hell seize his soul, the hound, the lying fox, the accursed robber. And what a simple fool I to be caught thus in his trap after fifteen years a carrier and never once losing a medio. It was a sore loss for Jose, for the money included not only the price of the wheat, but a debt returned by a Guadalajara trader to a man in Zapotlaneo. Not a great sum, in all eighteen hundred dollars, but the loss would ruin poor Jose. He recovered his senses, tethered his mules, and made the best possible speed back over the road in the hope of finding a false stranger, but Jose soon saw that it was useless, and even could he have found the fellow, such rascals go well armed. Then he turned about, bethinking himself that he would call out his friends in the village, and together they would scour the country for the thief. Night came soon, and Jose slept in the open air under a tree. He had often done the same, and now he felt that there was nothing left to be stolen save his beasts. At noon the next day, poor Jose re-entered Zabotleneo, sad, dejected, tearful. He went directly home, and his sorrowful appearance cast consternation among the little loving household group who discerned him a long way off up the white, dusty road. Dona Paz did not weep, but simply said, My poor husband, we must toil like slaves to return this money, and await the ways of God, who will punish the unjust. Later in the day, Jose went to the alcalde and told the story, and that worthy, a man who dearly loved adventure, summoned all the horsemen in town, and for four days they scoured the roads in quest of the tall stranger. But he was never caught. The alcalde decided that, as Jose had not observed due caution, he was responsible for the loss, but that it would be folly to take his mules from him, as with them he could, possibly, in the course of time, recoup himself, and even Don Gumicindo Vallas, the principal loser by the robbery, magnanimously told Jose that he would take half the loss on himself as a punishment for not having provided Jose with a guard. For seven years Jose followed his calling. Weekly he went with his beasts to Guadalajara, and every month he turned over his surplus gains to the grain merchant and to Don Gumicindo. The table in the little house of adobe was thinly spread. Dona Paz seldom saw a new gown, much less a rebozo, and the children were almost in rags. In seven years, Jose had repaid the lost funds, all save seventy-five dollars. But, though he was nearly out of debt, he foresaw clearly that he would never be able to buy his coach for the so long projected diligence line to Guadalajara. One crisp, cold day in December 1830, the Emperor Tubide had been shot years before at Padilla, and many things had changed in Mexico, except Zapotlaneo, which never changed, or Jose, who still preserved the kindly temper, but was now a wary man, not to be gulled by any sort of road sharper. On that bright, cool December day, Jose started with a load of wheat for Guadalajara, with instructions from the grain merchant to sell the wheat immediately on arrival to the highest bidder. It was curious that on this day, as he jogged along with his little caravan, Jose should have begun to indulge himself in his old dream of a stage line. He reasoned it out in this wise. I am out of debt, or will be in two months, and for all these years I've been known as an honest man. Someone may be found to lend me money to buy a coach and give me time to pay the loan. Then he began to estimate the number of travelers, and calculated that the convenience of the stage would stimulate travel. Even if the diligence just maintained him, his mules would steadily earn the money needed to repay the loan. 
Jose imagined himself snapping his coachman's whip and dashing up to the great inn of Guadalajara in fine coaching fashion, the mozos running out to hold the horses, the landlord treating him as an equal, his coach kept clean and attractive, himself come to be a most important personage. After these pleasant visions, the stern common sense of his mind began to assert itself. No, no. Always would he remain poor José Marín, the muleteer, who had allowed himself to be duped by a wily rascal. He recalled shakes of the head among his neighbors in Zapotaneo, and jibes and jests regarding his tonteria, or folly, these being indications, he thought, of the low estimation in which he was held for his business ability at home. Poor José. He was suffering as we all do when we begin to realize that it is very difficult to put stone foundations under our air castles. He stopped on the road, this humble man and poor, dropped on his knees in the common dust, and then and there thanked God for his goodness in preserving his life till he could extinguish a just debt. For heavens, having kept his dear wife and little family all these years in health and happiness, though bread was sometimes scarce. Rising from his knees, he lifted his eyes to the great blue dome of the sky, and a mighty peace flowed in upon his soul. Jose, the poor muleteer, had spoken to Almighty God, the protector of the humble, and a time of refreshment to his spirit had come. In the great happiness of his honest heart he sung, he bethought himself of his blessings. He had not been stricken blind like his old companion in arms, Maza. He had not lost his wife like Bravo, and his Isabel was fair to look upon, a tall, handsome girl, as good as beautiful. It was in this thankful and almost buoyant mood that José Marín entered Guadalajara. Passing through a broad street, lined on either side with the great houses of Los Ricos, José and his mules were stopped by a servant, who said the master would buy his grain. Entering the great courtyard of a luxurious mansion, the mayor domo, or steward, quickly made a bargain, paid a round price for the wheat without once attempting to haggle over the trade, and courteously invited José to dine with him in his room. This unexpected courtesy to a poor fellow like himself, a dusty carrier, overcame José for a moment, but, with that self-respect and courtesy characteristic of the humblest Mexican, he accepted the invitation and hugely enjoyed the mayordomo's fare, a striking contrast to the food served at the maison, where he usually tarried. After lunch, the mayordomo had for José a fresh surprise. El amo must needs speak with him, and would the muleteer ascend to the master's despacho? Puzzling over this matter, but thinking it possibly meant a fresh order for grain, poor José, very much bewildered, went up the broad, easy stairs to the upper landing, where a tall, dark gentleman greeted him with, Amigo, como la va? and a hearty embrace. In his confusion, José did not recall the resemblance to the other tall, dark men whom he had most unfortunately met seven years before. But, the master of the house, drawing José into the despacho, made him sit down, and thus addressed the muleteer. My friend, seven years ago, I, being tempted of the devil, whose ways and works I have forever renounced, foully deceived and robbed you, inflicting, I fear, a grievous wrong upon you and yours. How often and how bitterly I have mourned that wicked act I cannot say, Long ago I would have made restitution, but that I could not recall your village, having been at the time of the robbery intoxicated and in distress of mind. When I encountered you on the road, I was a fugitive from justice, and my evil genius tempted me to play you a dastardly and wicked trick. Today, sitting on my balcony, I saw you pass by. My heart leapt to my throat. The long-awaited opportunity had come. Behold, my friend, that I have caused your bags of wheat to be emptied and have replaced the grain with silver coin. It is plata por trigo. To carry home the burden, I have provided other mules to aid you, and these you must keep. To you I owe my wealth. Fleeing from you, I hid in the hills, and there found the mine which made me a rich man. 
Today I found you, and a burden has rolled from me, a burden hard to bear, the memory of a foul and wicked act, the betrayal of a good man's confidence. Hereafter you are my friend. This house is yours whenever you visit Guadalajara, and I shall place soon in your hands lands and houses to the extent of half my wealth. Conducting the amazed Jose to the courtyard, the rich man pointed out the sacks of silver and the guard of trusted Mezos, who were to accompany Jose to his home. A finely caparisoned horse was given Jose, who, on leaving, embraced his benefactor and returned home a rich man. And Dona Paz? What did the good wife say when her Jose rode up to the door on a great horse with silver-mounted saddle, escorted by armed men, and with mules well-laden with precious silver? Dona Paz embraced her husband, and then silently went into the little parlor, and thanked the Blessed Mother that the great wrong had been made right. And Isabel was by her side in that honest and tearful outpouring of praise and gratitude. The next week came the lawyers from Guadalajara and settled property valued even in those days at a quarter of a million dollars on Señor Don José Marín, the outright gift of his friend, Señor Don González Sario, and on the pretty Isabel was settled an estate near Guadalajara, which made her no inconsiderable heiress, and where she afterward lived with her husband, who married her not for her money, for long before good fortune came they had met and loved. As for Jose, he went to Guadalajara to reside in a great mansion, and with the family went Father Nicholas, best of priests and kindest of old friends, one who, during the seven years of poverty in the Casa Marine, never failed to comfort with words of good cheer. I fancy the reader will not condemn a tale that ends in a happy fashion, and the approval of the kindly critic will be assuredly given with great heartiness when I add that this plain story, devoid of all ornament or accessory of embellishment, is one of the true tales of Mexico. The best sentence in this story is, The unexpected courtesy to a poor fellow like himself, a dusty carrier, overcame Jose for a moment, but with that self-respect and courtesy characteristic of the humblest Mexican, he accepted the invitation and hugely enjoyed the mayor domo's fare, a striking contrast to the food served at the maison where he usually tarried. I love that. And I love the idea that a person who's so poor and humble conducts themselves, just as the author says, with self-respect and courtesy. I love that Jose, despite all of his hardships, still has self-respect and holds his head high. So, of course, if you've ever been poor, this story just broke your heart for a moment. This kind man with ten kids, working hard, saving a little money, trying to plan for his children's future, would suddenly be so shockingly in debt, an amount that must have seemed absolutely impossible to repay. You know, and that terrible feeling you have when you're broke and you just get a little bit ahead and then something happens to take everything away from you again. Their bare little table and their worn out clothes for seven long years. The most wonderful moment is when Jose is on his last trip and he starts fantasizing again about starting the stagecoach line and then he thinks, no, no, that's not for you. You'll always be poor and struggling and everybody at home is laughing at you. And right there in the road at that moment, he drops to his knees and he proceeds to thank God for being able to repay his debts and keeping his family safe and healthy all these long poor years. What an amazing character. To take refuge right in that moment of pain in gratitude and positivity rather than falling into anger and resentment, even though he has so much cause for those things. What a wonderfully wholesome story all around. So I admit to knowing very little about the history of Mexico. Uh, this story claims to be a true story, and there's nothing inherently impossible or unrealistic about it. It prompted me to read up and learn more about the Mexican War of Independence and Emperor Iturbide, which is a pretty wild story. The one thing in terms of fact and history that I find implausible about the story is that the characters live in Zapotlanejo and they fight in the War of Independence, but the story never mentions the Battle of Calderon Bridge. 
I find that curious because, okay, the battle took place in 1811 and our story begins in 1823. And at that time, Jose already has 10 kids and he's already fought in the war and everything. So this battle would have been recent history to these people. Also, Sepotlaneo is a tiny town. It has one landmark and that landmark is the Bridge of Calderon, built in 1670. And it has one historic event, and that event is the Battle of the Bridge of Calderon. During that battle, about 8,000 Spanish royalist troops defeated about 100,000 Mexican insurgents by blowing up their munitions wagon as they sought to hold the bridge. That battle was a key turning point in the first stage of the war, and the loss ultimately led to the capture and executions of Hidalgo and all the other insurgent generals. So it is really weird to me that the story would specifically mention Jose and his friends suiting up and going off to war, and not mention the 100,000 troops who mustered for a huge battle just outside the town at the famous bridge. Now, I'm not saying that that makes the story untrue. I'm just saying it's a really weird omission to me. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that I think that I will be in Denmark when you're hearing this story. I've recorded a little bit ahead so that videos can continue to come out while I'm traveling. I'm uh, attending a client's event in uh, Odense, but I am taking a few days of holiday in Copenhagen first. I really do love Denmark. It has impeccable vibes and it's such a fascinating country. It's a lot like the Netherlands, and then it kind of lays low on the world stage, but when you look a little closer, you realize it has really a lot going on. I've been, I don't know, maybe seven or eight times now, and I know enough to know that I will in no way be prepared for the weather, but how can you prepare for the weather in Denmark? It goes through six seasons every single day. You just have to find somewhere to wait for an hour or two until it changes. Anyway, I'm never dressed appropriately. I'm always surprised by what happens over the course of the day, and that just is how it is. And I'm very much looking forward to it. If you like things that are inappropriate and unpredictable, you should subscribe to this channel. At Restored Lore, I bring you old, odd literature twice a week, and you wouldn't want to miss anything. Please also help support the channel and help other people find it by liking this video, maybe dropping me a comment below, or even sharing it with a friend. Thank you so, so much for listening, and I will see you in a few days.